We are pleased that you were able to come out this morning to this event. I see where the main topics will be looking at what is the Magna Carta, what is the relevance of Magna Carta in the 21st century in the Commonwealth Caribbean, and how has the Magna Carta influenced the development of human rights and government lands in Cayman Islands, among other things. I hope that at the end, we will all be edified, and we would have been pleased that we came out this morning. To begin, we'll have the singing of the national song by Pastor Fair. Would you please stand? Understand, Lord, that the Bible says, This is the day that the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord God, we, we want to ask you today, Lord, that you'll grace us with your divine presence, with your divine wisdom and understanding that we need to accomplish the very task that will be laid before us today. We ask you, Lord, that you'll bring forth movers and shakers trailblazers even from this meeting. People who will not only desire to make a difference, but be the difference that the world needs today. We ask the Lord to go before us, behind us, on either side, and let your divine blessing be upon this meeting today. We give you thanks for hearing and answering. In Jesus' name, amen. Dr. Phyllis Fleming Banks, Manager, UWI Open Campus, British Overseas Territory, will now bring us welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Honorable Attorney General, Mr. Samuel Belgium, QC, JP, our esteemed panelists, Mr. Sasha Bonner, Mr. Von Carter, Dr. Amit Ghani, President of UCCI, President Bodden, President of the ICCI, President Marshall, our esteemed UB alumni, students and friends and supporters, staff and students of the various institutions. Good morning. On behalf of the University of the West Indies and the Open Campus in particular, along with the Faculty of Social Sciences and the Constitutional Affairs and Parliamentary Studies Unit at the University of the West Indies St. Augustine Campus in Trinidad and Tobago, along with the Magna Carta 800th Anniversary Committee, it is my pleasure and indeed a great honor to welcome you to this historic occasion which marks the commemoration 
of the signing of the Magna Carta some 800 years ago, and it provides an opportunity to examine its impact on our Caribbean societies in the 21st century. It is noteworthy that the Cayman Islands has the distinction of being the only British overseas territory to host this event, and that fittingly, this session is the grand finale culminating the series that have, held, have been held in nine other Commonwealth territories around the region. I am particularly pleased to have this coincide with my first formal visit to the Cayman Islands of Ben Campbell site as manager of the British Overseas Territories in the University of the West Indies Open Campus. I would like to publicly thank the UWIOC Cayman Islands team, including Venice Pollitt and members of the Cayman UE alumni, the students and friends and supporters, for the hard work that went into the planning, organizing, and staging of this event. I have been told that the name of our keynote speaker today has caused some ripples throughout the public service and the wider community at large. I understand that we are in for a rare treat. So from this distinguished uni alumnus, we say thank you very much, Mr. Attorney General, for agreeing to be our keynote speaker. We are delighted and honored to have you share with us today. We are also extremely privileged to have two distinguished and esteemed panelists in the persons of Ms. Natasha Gordon and Mr. Vaughan Carter. They are no strangers to you here in the Cayman Islands, and we look forward to the great input that they will bring and share with us to enrich this experience for all of us. We are also very delighted to see this turnout this morning, and we are especially pleased to have our students, be it from the high schools, the colleges, and the University of the West Indies, here with us as well. And we look forward to your participation through your questions and comments following the presentations. Thank you and enjoy. Thanks, Dr. Fleming Banks. At this time, we'll hear from Dr. Hamid Ghani, Senior Lecturer in Political Science and Coordinator, Constitutional Affairs and Parliamentary Studies Unit, UWI St. Augustine, Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Honorable Attorney General Samuel Baldino QC, JP, Dr. Planning, Phyllis Planning Banks, Manager, UE Open Campus British Overseas Territories, <clears throat> Natasha Bodden, Mr. Vaughan Carter, distinguished uh, members, uh, President Bodden and President Marshall from the UCCI and ICCI, respectively, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It's indeed a pleasure for me to be here on this, the, the final lecture in a series of Magna Carta distinguished lectures that have been held around the Commonwealth of Caribbean. Uh, last August, the Magna Carta 800th Anniversary Committee uh, published the offering of a number of research grants uh, for academic institutions to apply for such grants in order to further the work of the Magna Carta in the 800th year uh, of its celebration. Uh, my unit at uh, UB St. Augustine, the Constitutional Affairs and Parliamentary Studies Unit, uh, we applied for one of the grants and in October we were advised that our application was successful. The proposal that had been put in was to have a number of lectures and seminars around the Commonwealth Caribbean and also to have uh, one in the British Overseas Territory. Uh, so that we have had uh, lectures and seminars. The first one was held uh, at the UB St. Augustine campus in Trinidad on the 18th of October uh, 2014, uh, at which time the chairman of the Magna Carta 800th Anniversary Committee, Sir Robert Worcester, came to Trinidad to launch uh, our series of lectures and seminars. 
and then there was a hiatus and we started in January. On the 9th of January, we had uh, a lecture seminar in Dominica. On the 17th of January, we had one in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. On the 29th of January, we had one in Belize. On the uh, 11th of February, we had one in St. Lucia. And just prior to that, on the 2nd of February, we had one in Montego Bay. And on the 4th of February, one at the Mona campus in Kingston. On the 20th of February, we had one in Barbados at the Cahill campus. And last Friday, we had one in St. Kitts. So we're here today for the final in this uh, series of lectures and seminars on the Magna Carta in the Common of Caribbean. At the end of this exercise, uh, what will happen is that all of the distinguished lectures that have been delivered will be compiled into an edited volume uh, that I shall edit and be published so that those who will come to celebrate the 900th anniversary long after we're all gone will have something that we at least did uh, during our time here. Uh, there is uh, a 700th anniversary collection that was done by the Royal Historical Society um, that, that I have looked at uh, in the process of preparing for all of these lectures and seminars. And therefore, the first common Caribbean contribution uh, to uh, the celebration of the Magna Carta will come out of what, uh, what we should do uh, from all of these lectures and the seminars that, that we're having around the region. Uh, the exercise is one that um, is intended to raise the consciousness and awareness of the Magna Carta. Uh, there are many persons who perhaps, uh, from my own travels around the region, um, did not know about the Magna Carta so that uh, the event does uh, provide an opportunity for raising the level of consciousness and awareness of the Magna Carta and its influence in human rights issues and constitutional drafting and preparation. It has survived for 800 years. There are many aspects of it that were peculiar to the time, and there are other aspects, uh, philosophically, that have informed uh, many constitutions and have informed uh, human rights uh, issues uh, around the globe. Uh, but I don't want to be giving the lecture this morning because I want to leave that for the uh, Attorney General when he uh, does come forward uh, to deliver. So I'm very grateful to be here. I want to thank the University of the West Indies Open Campus staff for all of the arrangements uh, that they made. Uh, we've been having emails back and forth for several months now and uh, we've culminated with this event this morning. So. It's a pleasure for me to be here, and I'm grateful to you for taking the time to come here to be here this morning for this lecture. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Ghani. Now we have greetings from the president of UCCI, Dr. Barton. Good morning. Protocol having been already established. Let me just say what a delight it is for us at the university to be able to provide the facilities for this distinguished lecture. The University of College of the Cayman Islands sees itself as a vehicle group for the promotion of knowledge and learning. And this is especially important in a Caymanian society, which it seems is developing as never before a thirst for knowledge. I'm especially delighted to be a facilitator for this topic this morning, because it seems to me that there can be no more pressing matter of public concern than the area of human rights. I can say that I'm a little disappointed that we don't have a more robust turnout, but perhaps all is not lost because we always remind ourselves around here, it's not always about quantity, but rather by quality. And so the persons who are here 
will provide eminent, will be eminent vehicles for the spreading of the knowledge in here this morning. Regrettably, I have to be asked to excuse as I have matters of pressing concern in the President's office. This time of year, just prior to the end of our semester and final exams, is one of the busiest times for the President. So I tender my apologies having to miss the lecture. I shall therefore have to be conscientious that when the edited volume is produced, I have to get a copy. I bid you a good day. Thank you. No, I can claim I will attend the University of the West Indies, and I'm also a graduate from International College of the Cayman Islands. At this time, I'm going to ask the President, Mr. Marshall, to bring us greetings. Good morning. It is really a significant day and a very uh, auspicious occasion, so good morning. Absolutely. Protocol already having been established, it is my extreme honor and privilege to be here today to bring you greetings on behalf of the International College of the Cayman Islands, ICCI, as we affectionately call it. Uh, many of you may not know as the oldest institution of higher learning on Grand Cayman, established in 1970. At the core of our mission is career preparation, producing leaders, and producing people who are committed to service to Cayman and beyond. As a U.S. accredited institution, it is no secret uh, that the very principles of Magna Carta are embedded throughout our curriculum. And how could they not be when you think about the influence of this magnificent document on the U.S. and in the Western Hemisphere? Uh, principally, our Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution itself, and the related Bill of Rights. It is really uh, quite a magnificent thing. I read uh, somewhere in the New York Times uh, about the anniversary celebration that uh, many youngsters in the U.S. celebrate the Magna Carta or the principles that they know it more, perhaps, than our own U.S. Constitution. Uh, on a personal note, growing up in the Baltimore, Washington Metroplex, it is uh, just uh, magnificent to see pieces of Magna Carta represented in architecture, in art, in the sciences, in humanities, uh, particularly when you go to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, visualization is there. And how magnificent it is that thanks to the efforts of an American financier who uh, some years ago purchased uh, one of the later copies or edited versions or revised versions of Magna Carta for $21 million, I believe, that the American people actually have the opportunity to go to several buildings, and in some cases one building, to see all of these documents sitting together. The Magna Carta, the U.S. Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, and the Bill of Rights. So it's very fitting for us to be here. We are just very pleased that uh, the University of West Indies has sponsored and is sponsoring these series of events which culminate uh, today. We congratulate you on uh, this effort. And I also agree with uh, President Biden. Uh, it matters not the number of people who are here. It doesn't matter that we have paused to pay homage to one of the greatest documents ever written anywhere in the world. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you for your efforts here today. And I wish all of you a wonderful day of engagement surrounding this magnificent document. Thank you. Right now, we're going to have our featured event. And Dr. Dani will be introducing our featured speaker. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, our featured speaker this morning is the Honorable Samuel Burton QC, JP, Attorney General of the Cayman Islands. He was appointed Attorney General and the third official member of the Legislative Assembly and Cabinet 
in July 2003 and he became a Queen's Counselor in 2004. The appointment to the Office of Attorney General was preceded by his service as Solicitor General for six years and prior to that as Crown Counsel and Senior Crown Counsel from 1992 to 1997. As an attorney at law, Mr. Bagan obtained his legal qualifications, LLD Honours from the University of the West Indies and the CLE from the Norman Manley Law School in Jamaica. He was a recipient of the Chancellor's Prize for the Law of Human Rights, the Sir Colin McGregor Memorial Prize and the H. H. Dunn Memorial Prize for legal drafting and interpretation. Prior to his employment with the Government of the Cayman Islands, Mr. Bergen served as Resident Magistrate's Court in the Registry, Resident Magistrate's Courts as Clerk of Courts under the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions in Jamaica. He was also an Associate Lecturer in Law at the University of the West Indies Mona Campus in Jamaica. His portfolio responsibilities include the Legal Department, Legislative Drafting, Law Revision, the Law Reform Commission, Financial Reporting Authority, and the Law School. He's also a Justice of the Peace for the Cayman Islands. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Honorable Attorney General, Mr. Samuel Bergen, QCJ. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Many thanks, Dr. Nyali, for your kind introduction. And it's certainly a great privilege for me to be here this morning. Uh, allow me to say thanks to Dr. Nyali and Fleming Banks, also the UWI Open Campus, Cayman Islands, the Faculty of Social Sciences, Constitutional Affairs and Parliamentary Studies Unit, UWI St. Augustine Campus, and of course, the Magna Carta 800th Anniversary Committee for this kind invitation to speak to you and to lend some perspective on this very significant occasion, the commemorative lecture series titled The Magna Carta and Human Rights in the Cayman Islands, celebrating the 800th anniversary of the ceiling of Magna Carta, which of course took place back in June 15, 1215. Permit me to begin with an observation by Lord Jonathan Sumption, who is a judge of the UK Supreme Court. And he said, and I quote, it is impossible to say anything new about Magna Carta unless you say something mad. In fact, even if you say something mad, the likelihood is that it will have been said before, probably quite recently. So you must not expect any startling new line from me. And so with that caveat in mind, I must advise you that it is difficult to know what to say that has not already been said in this 800th year, which is the anniversary, or indeed in the past 800 years, in praise of Magna Carta. After all, its first draft was a failed peace treaty and was denounced by the 13th century Pope as very shameful. Pope Innocent III was so incensed that King John had granted his subjects such rights without papal authorization that he considered the Magna Carta to be an interference with his ownership of England, and so the Pope proclaimed it invalid forever. The world should be grateful to the regents, to King John's successor, the child King Henry III, who was, of course, only nine years old when he became a king. And those 13th century advisors, because whether they know it or not, they were forward thinkers. They were the ones who resurrected and remodeled the document after the death of King John, a document which is now widely regarded as the cornerstone of liberty and the rule of law in the English-speaking world. I think it is important to note that 2015, this year, is also a somewhat overlooked anniversary of another significant but somewhat related event. Indeed, 750 years ago, in 1265, 
an extraordinary parliament opened in Westminster. This was the brainchild of French-born Simon de Montfort, who became the Earl of Leicester and was married to the King Henry's sister, Eleanor. This 1265 parliament was from de Montfort's previous attempt at a parliament uh, in that is the 1258 Great, Great Council, I'm sorry, which met at Oxford, and at which a small number of commoners, essentially the landowning barons, were given a wider say in the government of England. Mr. Montfort had become leader of those who wanted to reassert the Magna Carta and to force the king to surrender more powers to his baronial council. King Henry, of course, had little choice but to agree to the provisions of Oxford, which emanated from the council, and which called for regular parliaments with representatives from the counties. But again, after papal intervention, King Henry reneged on his oath. This rejection by the king prompted a civil war between the barons and the royalists, which the Montfort, as leader of the barons, won. The subsequent January Parliament meeting for the first time on the 20th of January 1265 is described as an embryonic House of Commons and considered to be one of the most significant events in British democratic history. For the very first time, elected representatives from every county and major town in England were invited to Parliament on behalf of their local communities. During this first parliamentary sitting, it is thought that the text of the original Magna Carta was altered slightly and subsequently circulated more widely than before. And thus, my friends, the beginning of the Westminster system of governance and its corresponding model of constitution, both of which spread throughout the world and can be traced back to the 13th century and eventually to Magna Carta. So these two historical events can be seen as marking the start of a journey towards modern day rights and representation. Notwithstanding the reverence in which Magna Carta is held today, it may have remained legally inconsequential had it not been resurrected and reinterpreted by Sir Edward Coke in the early 17th century. Coke, then Attorney General for Elizabeth I, also Chief Justice during the reign of James, and the leader in Parliament in opposition, opposition to Charles I was an English barrister and a judge who was considered to be the greatest jurist of the Elizabethan era. He used Magna Carta as a weapon against the oppressive tactics of Stuart kings, arguing that even kings must comply with common law. Charles I had raised loans without Parliament's sanction and imprisoned without trial those who would not pay. This imprisonment was declared illegal by the courts. And because of this defiance of the king's will, the chief justice was dismissed. Unfortunately, his fellow judges succumbed to the king's pressure. However, more and more were refused to pay, leading to the Darnell's case in which the courts incredibly proclaimed that, and I quote, if no cause was given for the detention, the prisoner could not be freed, as the offense was probably too dangerous for public discussion. In modern days, it is all the way around, and no cause is shown for the detention, and they ought to be released. In those days, the court, in obedience to the king, said that no cause is shown for the detention, and they ought to remain in prison, because it was too difficult to discuss. The court had found in favor of the king, since the common law at the time had no control over the royal or absolute prerogatives of the monarch. The unrest grew to the extent that eventually martial law was declared, and anyone who refused to pay continued to be in prison. Soldiers were billeted into the homes of private citizens in an attempt to intimidate the population. And thus the origin of the saying, this famous saying, that an Englishman's home is his castle. The commons responded to these measures by insisting that Magna Carta, which expressed the forbade the imprisonment of free men without trial, was still valid. So the Petition of Rights of 1628 clarified this situation and limited the monarch's absolute prerogative. And Coke was able to proclaim to Parliament in 1628 that Magna Carta will have no sovereign, which in modern day parlance means that 
no man is above the law. Cook later went on to oversee the introduction of the Habeas Corpus Act of 1679, which reaffirmed that Magna Carta was still in force, and further reaffirmed that, and I quote one, no free man is to be committed or detained in prison or otherwise restrained by command of the king or the privy council or any other unless some lawful cause be shown. Modern day translation, no imprisonment without due process of law. They also proclaimed that the writ of habeas corpus cannot be denied, but should be granted to every man who is committed or detained in prison or otherwise restrained by the command of the king, the privy council or any other. And they further proclaim that any free man so committed or detained in prison without cause, being stated, should be entitled, should be entitled to bail or be free. Instructively, the writ of habeas corpus had existed in England for at least three centuries before tracing its origin back to Article 39 of Magna Carta. And you will be interested to know that Article 39 is the most important article of the Magna Carta. That article says, among other things, that no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or dispossessed or exiled in any way or destroyed, nor will we go upon him, nor will we send upon him except upon the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. They had further Habeas Corpus Acts, which were passed in the British Parliament in 1803, 1804, 1816, and 1832. But it was the Act of 1679 which was remembered as one of the most important statutes in English constitutional history. And though amended, it remains the study book to this day. Indeed, many distinguished judges, politicians, and chroniclers from all over the globe have commented on Magna Carta and its place in history. In 1766, before the drafting of the U.S. Declaration of Independence, as Dr. Marshall referred to earlier, the founding fathers searched for a historical precedent for asserting their rightful liberties from King George III and the English Parliament, and they found it in Magna Carta. Around the same time, William Pitt, the elder, and ironically, Prime Minister of England during the great unrest in the American colonies declared Magna Carta as, and I quote, the Bible of the English Constitution. And whilst war was raging around the world, a war fought on the basis of restoring and preserving democracy, President Roosevelt, in his third inauguration address in 1941, said, the democratic aspiration is no mere recent phase in human history. It is human history. It permeated the ancient life of early peoples. It blazed anew in the Middle Ages. It was written in Magna Carta. In 1956, Churchill wrote, and I quote, Here is a law which is above the king and which even he must not break. This reaffirmation of a supreme law and its expression in a general charter is a great work of Magna Carta, and this alone justifies the respect in which men have held it. In that same year, the great British jurist, Lord Denning, described Magna Carta as the great constitutional document of all times, the foundation of the freedom of the individual against the arbitrary authority of the despot. In 1988, Mrs. Margaret Thatcher, in her famous Brutus speech, stated that we in Britain are rightly proud of the way in which since Magna Carta, in the year 1215, we have pioneered and developed representative institutions to stand as bastions of freedom. So it is argued that Magna Carta led directly to the Bill of Rights in history, which Britain passed in 1689, and which codified the civil and polit political rights of all men, not just the lords and the barons. It granted freedom from, ta from taxation by royal prerogative, granted freedom to petition the monarch, freedom to elect members of parliament without interference, freedom of speech and parliamentary privilege, freedom from cruel and unusual punishment, and freedom from fine and forfeiture without trial. Magna Carta formed the basis of the U.S. Constitution in 1797, and two years later, the Declaration of the Rights of Man issued at the start of the French Revolution. 
By the time the 20th century arrived, a different and more complex and sophisticated world required different solutions. But even so, when the genocide and destruction of the Second World War led the members of the United Nations to adopt the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Eleanor Roosevelt, one of its architects, described it as the International Magna Carta for Mankind. More recently, in 2014, in the run-up to the celebrations of this year, the Right Honourable Fiona Wolf, who is the 686th Lord Mayor of the City of London, said that Magna Carta was the single most important legal document in history. It is the foundation for global constitutions, commerce and communities. It is the anchor for the rule of law. It is this latter scene I would like to just take up and briefly explore with you this morning, if I may. That is the foundation of global constitutions and the anchor for the rule of law. And in particular, they examine the influence of Magna Carta and the development of Cayman Islands as it evolved as a thriving and vibrant financial services jurisdiction, firmly underpinned, of course, by the rule of law. The Cayman Islands was discovered on the 10th of May, 1503, by Christopher Columbus, and the islands officially became a British territory when the Treaty of Madrid was signed in 1670, just over 450 years after the sealing of Magna Carta. The Cayman Islands, whilst initially under the governance of Jamaica, enjoyed considerable self-governance. Indeed, in 1831, a legislative assembly was established by the local consent at a meeting of principal inhabitants and passed the first local legislation on the 31st of December that same year. It includes an act to regulate the times of holding courts, a tax levy in law, and a law to regulate the attendance of jurors. So already we can see that the legislator was addressing issues related to the rule of law. In 1898, Jamaica appointed a commissioner in the Cayman Islands to oversee the affairs of the islands, as it was becoming increasingly difficult to do so from Jamaica. Under these first commissioners, the islands began to develop. It started with the schools, with schools, sorry, a bank, a small hospital, and a public works program. By 1909, the Legislative Assembly of Justices and Vestries were firmly established, meeting in the courthouse on the waterfront in what is now the headquarters of the Cayman Islands National Museum. The building then served as the seat of government and the courthouse. In 1953, the first airfield in the Cayman Islands was opened, as well as the Georgetown Public Hospital. Barclays Bank ushered in the age of formalized commerce by opening the first commercial bank. And during 1966, legislation was passed to enable and encourage the banking industry in the Cayman Islands. Following Jamaica's independence and withdrawal of membership from the Short and West Indies Federation, that was formed in 1958, the Cayman Islands emerged as a separate British colony in 1962. And ever since then, the laws of the Cayman Islands have been influenced by British law and by Jamaican law. Indeed, English law continue and remain influential in the development of the territory's jurisprudence to this day. In Europe, led by Sir David Maxwell Fife, a former Nuremberg prosecutor and the chair of the Council of Europe's legal division, British lawyers relied heavily on the principles found in the Universal Declaration, drafted what is known as the European Convention of Human Rights in 1950. And of course, that came into force in 1953. The UK was one of the first signatory to, signatories to the convention. The UK then sought to include overseas territories in the application of the European Convention on Human Rights. And accordingly, in a bid to enable the citizens to have their rights recognized and enforced, the individual right of petition to the European Court of Human Rights was initially extended in 1981 to the Cayman Islands for a period of five years. However, that ex extension expired in 1986 and was not then renewed. But recognizing the need for this remedy to be available to its people on a continuing basis, the government of the Cayman Islands requested that the right of the individual petition to Strasbourg be reinstated on a permanent basis. And this was done in February of 2006. Interestingly though, only one such petition from the Cayman Islands ever made it uh, to and heard by the European Court. 
and there was a case concerning fair trial. And although the applicant failed to persuade the Strasbourg court that he had not received a fair trial, it was clear that even without a justiciable bill of rights in our local courts and our constitution, there was access to justice all the way to the European Court of Human Rights back then. This incremental extension of the human rights framework laid the groundwork for the Cayman Islands to embrace the full gamut of the fundamental rights and freedoms when the Cayman Islands Constitution of 2009 was adopted. And so, fast forward into 2009, this Constitution further streamlined the rules of and the functions of the executive, including the governor, the legislature, and the judiciary. Most significantly, for the first time, the Constitution included a Bill of Rights, which came into force on the 6th of November 2012, and broadly reflects the European Convention on Human Rights, setting out the fundamental rights and freedoms of the individual and the rules for their enforcement. The framers of our Constitution no doubt learned lessons from their Commonwealth neighbors, most of whom had used the European Convention as a template for the human rights provision in their constitutions, and as a result, a drawing from the jurisprudence that had already emerged in those jurisdictions, the scope of the rights in the Cayman Islands Bill of Rights are articulated in far greater detail. Accepting, however, some differences in construction, it is still evident that the human rights recognized in constitutions across the Commonwealth are for the most part similar, a fact that serves to illustrate the universality of human rights that can be traced back to the principles enshrined in Magna Carta. Indeed, at various intervals, and as late as 2007, prior to our Bill of Rights, litigants before the Cayman Islands courts were praying in the principles of Magna Carta and the UK 1689 Bill of Rights. One example is in the case against Queen and Ebanks, where Mr. Ebanks contended that, that his sentence of firearm offenses was retroactive punishment and therefore unfair, and that the concept of such unfairness can be traced back to Magna Carta. And he quoted from the section of Magna Carta which provided that no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or be dispossessed of his freehold or liberties or free customs or be outlawed or exiled or any otherwise destroyed. Nor will we not pass upon him nor condemn him but for lawful judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land. So Mr. Ebanks will be no doubt happy to learn that even though he was unsuccessful in his bid, that the presumption against retrospective punishment is now firmly entrenched in our Constitution in Section 8 of the Bill of Rights. The well-established judicial system of the Cayman Islands has over the years played a major role in the development of the islands as a leading international financial services center. The Grand Court and the Court of Appeal routine, routinely decide complex cases of substantial commercial value, including cross-border insolvency cases, major trust litigation, international fraud and commercial disputes. And none of this would be possible, however, without a strong commitment to the rule of law and the opinion of jurisdiction providing not just stability and consistency, but being one of the best known regulated in accordance with international standards. Without the, fundamental without the fundamental principles enshrined in Magna Carta and adopted throughout the legislation and jurisprudence of the Cayman Islands, such stability and continuity would have been hard, if not difficult, possible to maintain as the country developed into such maturity and with such admiration. And I'm happy to emphatically state that the Cayman Islands is now one of the best regulated and most respected jurisdiction, and of course, the largest, fifth largest financial services center in the world, and with one of the most robust economies in the world, in the region, I'm sorry. So as the UK Lord Chancellor, the Right Honorable Chris Gale stated in a speech to the Global Law Summit in February this year in London, he said, a thriving legal system and respect for the rule of law go hand in hand with economic prosperity. In fact, they are the necessary foundations on which a strong and resilient economy is built. End of quote. The Cayman Islands is, in my view, an apt illustration of such combined qualities. 
since it comes into force of the Bill of Rights, already the courts here have addressed several constitutional matters, including human rights issues, and have generally been persuaded that the laws of the Cayman Islands are compatible with international principles of rights and freedoms for all. Indeed, even in the one case where the declaration of incompatibility was made, the incompatibility itself point was quickly ratified by the Legislative Assembly and thereby demonstrated the determination of the government to adherence to those principles and to uphold the rule of law. This challenge was started, ironically, by a writ of habeas corpus similar to the UK 1679 Act, and it was seeking a release of the detainee. And so, my friend, winding down, in 1215, when King John confirmed Magna Carta with his seal, he was acknowledging the now firmly embedded concept that no man, not even the king, is above the law. That was a milestone in constitutional thought for the 13th century and for centuries to come. Throughout history, these rights have been clarified and expanded, and much jurisprudence exists which has interpreted and reinterpreted how these rights are applied. Magna Carta established important individual rights that have a direct impact and came an island's Bill of Rights as part of a constitution based on Westminster rule of governance and adopted and applied to best serve the population of these islands. Some 200, some 2,000 delegates from around the world, including your student, we sent the gravel in London at a global law summit held in February this year to mark the 800th anniversary and the beginning of a year-long series of events to celebrate Magna Carta. This morning's events by the University of West Indies is obviously one of those. The scale of the attendance was set by the United Kingdom Law Chancellor to be a testament, not only to how important Magna Carta is around the world, but to the commitment to its values of justice and the rule of law. And so in conclusion, whatever might have been the real motive behind Magna Carta in 1250, one thing that is beyond doubt is that today's civilized democracies hold a genesis to that tumultuous declaration contained in that bit of parchment in all its various iterations. I do thank you.